All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, as you can tell, or maybe you're figuring out now as we're, as we're speaking live here, um, that you have been booted out of your breakout rooms and have been uh, dropped back into the main room. Apologies for some of the uh, 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 lack of a smooth transition with some of this. Um, with the breakout room, sometimes it does have a hard stop, uh, and, and it is hard when we're dealing with this many people being divvied up amongst those breakout rooms. Um, however, I did bounce around between many of the breakout rooms, and it seemed like there were some good conversations going. Everybody eventually got underway with their presentations, and I, I do apologize if some of you weren't able to give the full length uh, amount of presentation you had planned for, but hopefully at least uh, your audience now knows a little bit more about uh, what you're doing and has some frame of reference for following up with you to learn more. So next, we're going to transition into our remaining panel, which I think is one of the most important parts uh, of discussion for the day, um, now that we've had a full context about uh, some of the regulatory challenges, uh, some of the practices that are already underway, example, and breaking down some of the challenges across the lifespan from birth to end of life, uh, and then again, you know, spotlighting some of the different uh, solutions that are out there for people to leverage today, um, we still realize there's a lot of work left to be done and that uh, the issue of managing e-consent at scale is still not something that uh, we can readily count on. So we know that, that we need to still figure out how to, how to answer those remaining questions. And that's exactly what our remaining panel is gonna do for us, right? <laughs> so we've got Jocelyn Keegan uh, serving as moderator for today's panel. We've got Ryan Howells, as many of you know, Daniel Stein, uh, Alan Swenson and Jim St. Clair. Uh, really a star-studded panel here, uh, leading many of those efforts that we talked about before and, and are intersecting with um, what it's like to deal with e-consent at scale and, uh, and have some ideas uh, for, for some of the areas um, where we have solutions already underway, as well as um, where maybe we still need to kind of fix some problems and work together on this. So with this, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jocelyn, our um, fabulous moderator, to, to take us home. I'm not really sure if I'm a moderator today, if I'm more like, you know, um, containing the conversation inside the ring. So uh, super excited to be here. Uh, really awesome content. You know, this is not a place where I'm living on a day to day basis. Um, I've gotten pulled in to help moderate, but am a, a, am a, a adjacent to all of this work and the work that I get to do around an in industry, um, especially around the work we're doing at the APIs in DaVinci. Um, we have a really amazing set of folks. I'm going to let everybody actually do a quick round robin. And I think just to ground the conversation, just to do a little bit of um, an introduction for each of you of who you are, what org are you sort of representing here today, sort of versus your day job, um, and if we think about sort of the takeaways so far today, sort of the what is the what is the what is the point that we want to sort of break down in our discussion today? What's the stuff that we want to unpeel to Stefan's point and dive into in the next 30 minutes or so? So I'm going to hand it off first to Ryan and let him have the first crack at it. Sure. Uh, Ryan Howells, uh, Principal Levitt Partners, as well as helping to co-lead the Karen Alliance, which is focused on getting individual consumers digital access to their data doing that for the last seven years. So consent is really important to us. We implemented an informed proactive consent process through our care and code of conduct that's been implemented by the VHA and, and dozens and dozens of health plans and providers around the country. I, you know, some initial thoughts, Jocelyn, in terms of what I saw today, I think, um, and heard today, and as any ONC meeting, it's always spicy. So you've got great, you know, there's always the meeting and the, the side meeting, which is awesome. Uh, one is, there's just an, we need to acknowledge that we don't have any true dynamic federated consent models that work at scale today in healthcare or social mm -hmm. care. Like we just need to kind of acknowledge that. Um, we've got a single, you know, a paper-based authorization that's selling de-identified data downstream. That's not sustainable, right? So we've got to figure out a way to make this. We got to get it right. And we've got to use tools that we trust. I think the second point I'd make is Consent has to involve the individual giving their informed, proactive consent, agnostic of the use case, as Catherine said before. Uh, it's not paper-based one-time use. It's dynamic, person, context-centric. That's the second point. Third point is from a policy perspective, and this is really key because I've seen this throughout the conversation today. We will always underline, triple underline, quadruple underline, be dealing with multiple regulatory environments. Okay, so the data is, is going to be in multiple environments and we've got to figure out a way to share that consent across it. HIPAA, FTC, American Data Privacy and Protection Act, FERPA, COPPA, I mean, we can run through the whole list. Unless all of those are repealed and replaced by a massive data 
privacy, we are not going to be able to. So we have to realize that we need to feel comfortable. And the question isn't, when is the national privacy law going to happen? That may happen, it may not happen. The question is, how do we, how do we start to share data between these regulated environments? And then the final thing I'd say, Jocelyn, just thing is that solutions got to be open source. It's the only way to scale. They've got to be person centric and dynamic. They've got to be context specific on multiple regulatory environments. One solution is not going to rule them all. We're not going to have a massive consent database that the government owns. That's not going to happen or the private sector owns. And we have to start small. There's, I mean, I, we love the ONC and there's grateful for all these use cases, but some of these use cases are so far downstream to where we are today. We're just trying to standardize on a HIPAA consent authorization form, right? Like let's start there and maybe we can grow. So a few spicy comments to start us off. I think it's great. And I'm gonna actually hand it off to Jim next because I'm sure he'll have some agreement and uh, an add on to uh, his point of view. From where you started. Absolutely. Thank you, you bet. Thank you, Jocelyn. I'm Jim St. Clair. I'm the executive director for Linux Foundation Public Health. Um, in uh, my role, I curate and maintain uh, open source uh, uh, software projects with our membership. We're about 20 plus year old 501c6 membership association entirely focused on open source. And in our project, of course, as the name implies, we're focused on public health informatics, digital health solutions. And I've had the good pleasure to hang with, uh, with Daniel and Stewards of Change as we have been exploring the ins and outs of policies and workflows and technologies for, uh, uh, for consent and, and working with Ryan on identity aspects and HL7 and others. Uh, wholeheartedly concur with everything Ryan just said, very well articulated. And I would just add some spice to his spicy sauce and say, hopefully through these policies and procedures, we'll begin to inculcate a culture that appreciates privacy and consent uh, hand in hand with one another. And for those that have some experience working with the EU and GDPR, DSA and others, it really starts because their attitude concerning how consent works and what privacy consent and data protection mean together uh, is, is a very different, uh, very different scenario um, than it is culturally here in the US. And so that I think is the direction to move. Uh, concur with Ryan, obviously about open source, you wouldn't hear about it any more strenuously from me because open source means multi-stakeholder, collaborative, consensus-driven, open, transparent development of, of systems and projects that can be used in different ways and inculcated into commercial products, um, but are understood by all of the participants. Uh, and then lastly, I would just comment on, on stakeholders and the variety of stakeholders uh, that are involved you know, there are, there are standards that have been developed about consent and they're great standards, but I don't know if Native American tribes were consulted. I don't know whether or not there are um, um, among populations in Seattle representing that community that have been consulted and that has to be taken into account as well. Thank you. I think that's great. And it's a good segue back over to Daniel. Um, I had the good fortune for breakout of listening to Daniel talk about some of the modeling work that's happening right now within spirits of change. Um, so Daniel, why don't you pick it up from where you're sitting today? And I think as we start talking about sort of those folks that aren't in the middle of this today, right? And part of our health IT existing infrastructure. Yes, hi, thanks. I'm Daniel Stein, I'm the, the co-founder of Streets of Change and have been the squeaky wheel on the social services side for a number of years. So I've come to this conversation from the social services, public health education space uh, and recognizing that it's a different world uh, than healthcare in many, many ways, um, and that the uh, idea that, you know, information has to flow both ways, uh, and that um, non-healthcare entities need some healthcare information, but not all of it. Um, so um, I think it's important to, um, you know, start with that in mind as we think about uh, trying to address this complex issue, because my sense over the years has been, oh, we'll get to the social services, we'll get to them. It's one of those uh, we'll get to those at some point in the future, but I think we don't want to, I, I, I would hate to see the, all of the infrastructure built without really recognizing both the different standards that are out there, uh, driving justice, driving education, driving other, you know, housing and things like that. Um, and that um, we need to consider that from the beginning. I would also uh, suggest that we, we educate ourselves around system of systems thinking. Um, you know, we live in silos, but the world is not siloized. And that, uh, you know, the good fortune we had of being able to work with Hopkins uh, and the Applied Physics Lab when we were doing some modeling work um, 
for human services, the whole concept of, you know, sort of Army, Navy, and Air Force, figure out how they could coordinate it may not be the best metaphor these days, but, um, you know, we can, we can uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think we need to bring engineering concepts to the table and think about system of systems as a way to really address this issue simultaneously. So I'll, I'll pass it back to you. I think that's great. And I think um, if we sort of just round out introductions here, Alan is coming to us really on the verge, right, of um, Tefka becoming reality out in the industry, sort of really looking at sort of breaking down walls and, and allowing people to get more access on the heels of 21st century cures, really going into effect, right, uh, within our existing sort of smaller healthcare ecosystem, not the larger ecosystem. And Alan, can you give us some thoughts sort of grounded on today's conversation, you know, really sort of where are we in reality and sort of where do we need to head? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Alan Swenson, the Executive Director of Care Equality. Uh, and in that role, uh, running the Care Equality Framework, I, I am also responsible for operationalizing TEFCA as part of the recognized coordinating entity working with ONC. So a lot of fun <laughs> splitting my time there between the work that's going on in care equality and, and a lot of things that are, are uh, you know, being mimicked or, or built onto and, and additional work being done with TEFCA. So in the context of consent and what we're talking about here, I think, I mean, Ryan said several things that, that I mean, we're right on that, I mean, we really haven't done anything uh, with federated consent at this point. Uh, there were a few comments in some of the, the earlier sessions uh, around, uh, you know, issues with uh, consent being collected and saying I have consent and whether that's my consent versus your consent. Uh, if organizations, and, and Ryan touched on that a little bit as well, there isn't a standard consent form. Uh, and so one organization that believes they have a form that satisfies consent, but maybe not satisfies what the, uh, the other side that actually holds the record and needs to make the determination of release uh, says satisfies their requirement for consent. Uh, and so in, in both care equality and TEFCA, I mean, we are uh, relying largely on where the industry is at technically or, or with the technology that's available. And that largely is pointing to some of the IHE standards for asserting uh, access consent policies or instance access consent policies, IACPs. Uh, and, and ultimately what that means is that the organization requesting information can assert to the record holding organization that they have a certain type of consent on file. And that consent can be I uh, requested and retrieved and, and looked at, but it is largely relying on uh, the responding organization, record holding organization, uh, making a determination based on the consent that is asserted from the requesting organization, not vice versa. And in some cases that, that flow works really well, such as the Social Security Administration doing uh, disability determination, right? They, there is a specific form. Everyone knows this is the SSA's form. This is what you're gonna get whether you like it or not, like this is the form. Uh, and so as to say, can assert, this is our form, we're doing a request, and this is the consent that this satisfies it. In other cases, that, that's, not, that's not always so. And, and even uh, with just within treatment uh, between HIPAA covered entities, uh, you know, varying state laws and, and organizations of what they believe is required, uh, it certainly gets difficult. But that is where today we're at, uh, is working toward how can we get in place, what are the standards going to be, for implementing across these frameworks uh, a, a form of federated e-consent, where today we're really starting at the point of, I have something on file that I believe is good enough, and I'm going to tell you about it, and hopefully you also agree it's good enough. So before we dive into sort of future states or where we want to head, I'd love to get just some feedback from the, the, the group in general about, you know, what has made this harder, a uh, harder nut to crack? Why has it been so elusive for us to be able to make progress, really? Um, across the board on this topic? Why does it keep getting kicked down, you know, sort of kicked down the curb, sort of at a, a systemic level of being solved? And what is it that we can be doing sort of to this audience and to our, our colleagues at ONC to really arrest to get traction? And I'm going to go to Ryan first. We have a lot of lawyers, Jocelyn. That's <laughs> Being cynical. We're talking about cynical, Ryan, today. I'm, I'm there with you. All right. Let me give you a serious <laughs> answer. The serious answer is that we really haven't needed this as at scale as we do today. Now, some may argue that that's not the case. Daniel's gonna argue that, I'm gonna argue that, others are gonna argue that we, we actually have needed this all along. And I'm not gonna argue with that. I'm just saying that we're moving from a point to point interoperability model to a network of networks. Alan's point is super important, okay? 
Alan's point is we've got to meet the industry where it is today. I think we're all unhappy with where it is today, but it's where we are today. We've made incremental progress, right? Nobody's, nobody's satisfied with where we are. We've got to move it to the next level, but we've got to build on what we already have and then figure out a way forward. To Alan's point, the federal government has actually standardized on some of this stuff. Well, it's good enough for them. It should be good enough for us, right? So how can we figure out a way to just build on the great work that's already been done and move it forward? The other reason um, you asked about why this is, hasn't scaled, there is no incentive inside of HIPAA to federate e-consent. No one is like getting more money for it or they're not you know, providing, there's no bigger HCAP scores for this. Like there's nothing that's actually saying, I should adopt an e-consent process. And there's no regulation that has required it. We've talked about the idea that it's, it's voluntary. So is TEFCA. So how do we figure out a way to, to make this for individual organizations a competitive advantage? We had this conversation three years ago in Karen where we said, we recognize you don't have to actually accept an individual's personal preferences for how they share their data. But is that to your competitive advantage in an environment where you're looking for person-centric solutions and looking at whole person care and the barriers around healthcare data has now been starting to be dissolved? That could be actually a competitive advantage. So that's what's one aspect is how do we incentivize people, whether it's carrots or sticks, inside of HIPAA to adopt this. The second piece is outside of HIPAA. We think there are four pillars specifically outside of HIPAA that we have to get right as a country. One is federated digital identity. We haven't talked about that as much as we should, but the idea that I have my identity, I can take my identity wherever I want, one OAuth process, and on a volunteer basis, I can be able to figure out a way to, to authenticate in. Two is app registration. How does the app actually connect to the endpoint? We gotta standardize that. It's gotta be easier, both on a B2B side and BBC side. Three is public endpoint discovery. We need a directory and address book. We've talked about that a long ways. And I know Alan and everybody else and others are working on this. But then the fourth is federated e-consent. We, we really believe that health and human services, because now all the Medicaid agencies have got fire API um, infrastructures in place, we fully believe that health and human services is now going to come along with healthcare and come along with others all the work that Gravity is doing with the CBOs. Like this is going to be a true integrated environment. And so we're gonna have to get this right, those four pillars right to figure out a way for this data to move. And we're gonna have to base it on the realities of the fact that we're going to live in multiple regulated environments. So how do we do that at scale and, and do it in bite-sized chunks so that we can figure out a way to make this work for the country? So I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot over and I'm gonna actually ask Jim and Alan who wants to go first here because I think that there's the kind of you know I think we're all sort of leading forward in our seats listening to what Ryan's saying but then there's the sort of the current reality of where we are right just trying to connect the existing participants right more um, more elegantly more easily right uh, as we think about sort of Tefka becoming a reality and then the scaling issue right um, Jim I I, I chuckled of our prep sessions as we were listening today, um, watching the uh, versions of architecture begets policy, begets architecture over and over again, sort of in today's threads of conversation. And, and I think both of those, you know, sort of both of those realities, right? We are where we are today, like Ryan said, but, you know, where are we today? And, 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 and how do we start to get that traction, you know, in a, a 12 month period, an 18 month period for real, so. Absolutely, I'm and I'll just add. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. I was, I was going to say, I, I'll add again that I once again was all in agreement with Ryan, except that he made the minor mistake of pointing to federated identity instead of decentralized identity, where he and I have talked about decentralized being Web 3.0 and not 2.0. But th hey, that's Jim, all Jim, Jim we don't have either one yet, okay? <laughs> but, but Ryan's spot on. We don't have either, you know. We don't even we're, have either we're, one. So we're it's... arguing about whether we need a Porsche or a Ferrari, and neither one of us have got a racing license yet. So exactly right. But And, and I guess with that point, pick up to your theme, Jocelyn, um, uh, I think what Daniel and I have been discovering quite a bit, too, is that in offering base products, some of the things that, uh, that Ryan's talking about, the consent utility uh, open source projects that we're working on, just explaining that architecture starts getting people's wheels turning as to what their policy should be. And I think uh, going back to our, our um, uh, breakout room one, 
we started off by talking about a survey of the audience participants who all said that they were essentially collecting it on paper or maybe yeah. an electronic form or something. And at the end, we're talking about, well, how do we dynamically assign the consent? Well, you know, there's a long road to travel, as Ryan also pointed out there, um, but the tools are there. So sometimes demonstration of those tools, showing what is facilitable, show what will fit into a workflow. A workflow. Um, I know Mary Sarah was briefing um, Amazon's uh, AWS's plans around a tool, and we've talked a bit about how that could potentially fit well into existing paper-based workflows where you can't afford to walk into an organization and not only say you're gonna implement e-consent, but say, quit filling out papers and go to this web form. How, how do we transform one process into a new process? What's the skeuomorphic considerations for changing the way those people work? And that's gonna be the, the key to uptake. I think we've heard it consistently through the day. There's a lot of people that want consent, not only just patients, but providers and organizations yeah. that want to be able to offer consent. But, but it's daunting to consider, first of all, the mechanisms involved in negotiating the policies. And so where architecture can support those policies or new policies can come out of that architecture where the value lies. So I'm gonna, I wanna get Alan's take on this, especially as he starts to open up, right? Basically one of the largest networks of where we can unleash clinical data today in the industry. But I wanna pivot directly after Alan over to Daniel to talk about, well, what are we doing to serve the people that actually need this data today? that really need this data, but also I think, Daniel, you've done a great job of keep bringing us back to it. The, the, it has to be bi-directional, right? As we start to bring social services in, we have to make sure the data is flowing in both directions. So, so Alan, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit, right? Cause we get to work together. Um, you know, we're still struggling to get people to do stuff beyond treatment in the current state, right? From care quality and to payment and operations. How are we gonna, you know, get to a point where we really can, you know, do, you know, N number of, you know, different scenarios and use cases of how and where we need to make this data be shared, um, you know, based on where we are today uh, with uh, with care quality and the emerging RCE. Yeah, great, great question. I think, I mean, Ryan made a great point about the, the perception, right or wrong, that the reason we haven't solved this is because it hasn't been needed. And, and while, you know, it has been needed to some extent, it certainly has not been a focus of, you look at what uh, you know provider organizations EHRs are required to do under ONC certification or you know meaningful use or promoting interoperability whatever a lot of the focus has been let's get more and more provider to provider exchange for the purpose of treatment under HIPAA um, and that's the scenario where consent is the least needed or, or at least what we're talking about in particular with you know types of exchange consent for exchange with non-HIPAA covered entities um, and so, as you said, in, in carry quality today, you know, we're seeing 350 million clinical documents exchanged on a monthly basis, and that's almost exclusively provider to provider. Um, it's all, you know, HIPAA covered entities, and, and we do allow for other purposes, but they're, they're really not being used because of the optionality behind a lot of it. And in TEFCA, you know, we're starting out similarly with requiring treatment, but also requiring individual access services, which is an individual's ability to get information through like a patient, patient app. And then we'll be adding on some of these other things. Um, and so looking at consent for, you know, social services or, you know, life insurance, disability, whatever, uh, a lot of that historically has been point to point. The provider organization knows the social service organization that it's working with. It can coordinate that point to point and figure out what is specifically needed. But then the social service organization can only get data from that one provider organization because that's who they have the agreement with. And so the whole purpose of care equality and then as we're expanding things with TEFCA, is to make it so that social service organization can connect to the framework and now has the ability to request information from any provider organization that participates anywhere in the country uh, without having to have any pre-existing relationship with that organization. But then we get back to the need for how do you trust the consent that's coming from this social service organization if I as a provider organization know nothing about who they are other than the fact that they participate. And so there is an element of ensuring trust in the framework and being able to, to handle uh, how can we ensure everybody is, is able to know enough about what others in the framework are required to do to be able to have that trust. But then where the law also requires explicit consent, we're going to need to figure out how can we either have a consistent consent form so such that what I'm asserting to the responding side is what the responding side needs, or else some other method of federated consent to allow the, the social service organization, for example, to know specifically what it is that the provider organization needs 
through the framework without having to have a pre-existing relationship with them. And I think there's a lot of work technically that needs to be done there to define uh, how, how a lot of that would actually happen. And I'm not going to prompt you, just dive right in, Daniel, because I know you're very <laughs> patiently been waiting. Not sure which, direct, which, which side of the pool to jump in here. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think about uh, California and New York with these giant 1115 waivers looking at whole person care, looking at whole person care, which says, how do you bring together the whole person um, in order to really um, provide services? So I think it's not a theoretical question anymore. It, it is a very real question in terms of how do we get this CBO information. Well, the CBOs can flip it around and say, well, who are you guys? We, we're in conversation with our customers every day. They're walking in our doors. We know who they are. We know what they like. We know where they go to church. They, we know a lot about them. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of examples out there. Again, if we slow down a bit, a couple of great examples of um, you know, really whole person coordinated care at the county level where they're, they have one two page form. They're collecting all of the consents. It's, it's analog. Yep. They have a healthcare, they have a community health worker who is established as a relationship with somebody. They, they identity proof them because they, they sit next to them on the pew. <laughs> they get their signature and, and there's a relationship there. And it's not just about a CBO, but it's about all of the services that are being provided in the county. The thing we need to also remember, and this is gonna be important at the federal level is that there's something about half, of, something in the order of half of the population operates within a county administered system. And we forget that Medicaid and Medicare don't really, or Medicaid does not, I don't know if they know how to say county, uh, but in counties, if you think about the half a dozen, dozen or so uh, uh, county administered states, there's a lot of people who are really in the county. So when we talk about national systems, they don't really care about national systems. It's a county system or a group of counties that are important. So we need to think about framing where it is that we're working and who needs that information within an organization. Two other very quick things. One is, um, and I was hoping that we'd hear about that earlier today. I don't know if, I think, um, I'm not sure they're on the call here, but within HIPAA, there is a care coordination exception. We did not hear about that today. There is one for mental health, but there is a care coordination exception that allows you to share information. We've now verified that with multiple different sources. It's something that people don't talk about very much in the Network for Public Health Law. Uh, Chris uh, Albatroni and, and company really wrote, you know, sort of raised that up. And I think it's important we remember that those are possibilities. The other thing is, the final thing I'd say is going back to the legal and the attorneys, a lot of CBOs have a, a liability uh, yep. whereas the government does not. And so they have huge um, restrictions on what they're, and the inability to operate because the county or the state has just sort of shoved all their risk over to them. Uh, I think in particularly in the child welfare space, and that is stultifying in terms of being able to do anything. We need to think about how do we shift that risk and responsibility away from those CBOs who really can't afford it uh, in many ways. I think that this is such an important point, and I think a good segue to sort of our next um, line of questioning, which is really this idea of, you know, what is it that we need to do to remove barriers? And Daniel, I want to pull on a thread because I don't think the conversations that are happening at the county or the city or town level around liability are any different than the conversations that are happening inside of massive payer organizations or provider organizations, you know, to Ryan's point that are very risk averse about really taking on any sort of misstep of being a breach or of, you know, not following consent and having penalties, right? That it's a very punitive sort of way that we've been operating as an industry, you know, the fear of sort of being the person that's in the New York Times headline. Um, so I think that when we think about that and each of you think about sort of like, we've gathered this group of people, you know, we have 300 people on a call on a Wednesday in August, right? There's a ton of energy around this topic. You know, what are the, what are the things that we can do when we think about being able to unleash patterns or examples or expand existing networks to really get traction here? You know, how do we unblock the people that are out in our community actually starting to get this work done? And I'm going to toss it right back to Daniel because I know he's got a lot of ideas here. Um, and then we'll go to Ryan, Jim, and Alan down the, down the line. Yeah, I just, I, I think very simply, I think we need to link arms and actually go do this in a few places. And that's why I'm really excited about the, really the, co the coalition that's come together over the last couple of years 
that is really cross domain. It's kind of an unnatural act to work across these domains in some very real way. And so the fact that you've got <clears throat> New York, you've got Minnesota and Hennepin, you've got a bunch of other places, we really ought to take advantage of those shovel ready opportunities to actually even using synthetic data or synthetic personas, let's do it in a couple of places. And that will make the attorneys kind of relax a little bit, right? When we can show all these concepts. And I think we've got an opportunity. I think we can we can keep talking about this for the next 10 years, or we can, and or we can, we got to keep talking about it, of course, but we need to do it in a few places and we need high level, and I'm really super excited that the ONC is really focused on this now, but we need to do it and we need to be able to point at it and look at all the warts and pimples, but also the successes we've got. And that's why, you know, as, as Kathy talked about in our group, the early intervention, it's a different, it's a different take on it, right? The, last, the other thing I'd say is we got to demedicalize it, right? We got we to maybe shift it a little away from the medical establishment and the four and a half trillion dollar spend because it's not all about medicine, right? It's the other is uh, folks, it's the other 364 days a year that you're operating in your community. So we need to think about those two things as well in my mind. Uh, I'm gonna give most of the action items to ONC. That's the plan. <laughs> so here's what I would suggest. Number one, we've put a lot of links in the chat. So my hope is that we're gonna see those in some kind of a consolidated document at some point in the future. That'd be great. So we can at least know what everyone's doing and working on and all the technical solutions and the policy that defines it. That would that alone, just awareness of that would be outstanding. I think the second thing is we should really continue this dialogue. Thanks, thankful, really grateful for ONC to actually create this and this space where we can talk about this. Cause this is, we've been hearing this as a burning need, you know, since apps been able to get access uh, to data on behalf of patients. Um, this is a huge issue. SDOH doesn't actually work unless we can actually get this working at scale. So we need to keep the national dialogue going, but really find ways where we can take advantage of, of ONC's new authorities. So ONC has got these, uh, the blog post out there, new authorities that allow for them to start to convene the healthcare stakeholders and others within HHS and find ways to do this inside uh, their, you know, Ballywick. That would be really outstanding. Like, could HHS actually start to agree on a, on a, on a way forward here? What would they think in terms of, you know, with ONC's leadership of what this actually looks like across, to Daniel's point, health and human services? Um, I don't want to wait for that to happen. I think we can do it. To Daniel's point, we do need more developers engaged here and more policy people too. We need people that are willing to actually engage in, with both feet. I, it's never a technology issue, as all of us know. It's it's usually a business policy or operational issue that is keeping mm -hmm. us from progressing. And I think the same thing holds true here. We've got to figure out a way where we can get people engaged and involved and um, I made the lawyer comment earlier. I recognize that I'm going to get all kinds of hate mail probably on Twitter about the lawyers. We're not, I'm not saying we get a, get, get a rid of the lawyers. They're needed from a risk uh, mitigation perspective and they play a key role. But do, do what they, is, is what they do so proprietary and so magical? I go back to the HIPAA consent form, the HIPAA authorization form. We've had this in place now, folks, whatever the, whatever the number is, right? 25 plus years there should be, that is a very low bar in terms of risk associated with that. We should be able to come together on a voluntary thing, at least for that. Maybe that's a starting point that we can uh, start to rally around and then use the fire consent resources and other things to actually say, hey, we can actually computerize this uh, or any of the other dozens of, you know, technical solutions that may be out there. I'll go to Jim next. Sure, and I'll just build upon what uh, Ryan was saying. Having worked in the Hubert Humphrey building myself, rather than just lay this all at Stephen's feet, you know, it's it's ONC and bring in HRSA and bring in SAMHSA and bring in CMS, CMCS and bring in CMMI. These can all contribute. And then we have ways to enable and incentivize at the best conference and with Nandi, with the Medicaid directors and get them engaged as kind of a, hey, get on the train or you'll be in front of it with regards to where these policy directions are going, what expected to be seen out of grants and 90-10 waivers and, and, um, and, and get built upon from there. Um, and then I'd also comment, uh, almost separate but very related, the FTC is about to have a notice of proposed rulemaking 
uh, around privacy and data privacy and the like, and inculcating some of these concepts of privacy and consent that we're talking about here, because there's a very close relationship, if not necessarily an overlap, certainly in areas that have been called like commercial health information, things that aren't explicitly in PHI, but still relate to your portfolio of health. And I think it was Ryan who mentioned this before. You know, when HIPAA was written, we had paper files sitting on a shelf, and now we're in the day of inter internetworked systems and sharing data through web pages. We need to be able to address this from all directions and begin to, to manage more about consent across the board with all of your data, um, healthcare and social services exclusively as well. Turn to Alan. And Alan, maybe I have a little bit of twist um, on the question too, just around the idea of how do we broaden, right? That set of use cases and scenarios with the with the progress that you are making, right? To to get um, Tefka up and running, you know, um, is there is there is there something else that you need, sort of in that process, input wise, to be able to make sure that we're you know not doing what Daniel talked about, sort of rework in hindsight, right? By not having sort of those different scenarios, sort of in those early conversations. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly input of what's going on is is absolutely beneficial. I mean, there's a lot that I've learned here because I cannot be involved in every single thing that's going on everywhere in the industry. Uh, and so there, there, there's a lot of work being done. Um, I think one of the concerns of, of how do we you know, solve this uh, is like there, there are a lot of, and looking at chat, there were some you know, mention of, of pilots and things that are going on in different places. I sometimes worry as we get to this point in some of these discussions that we run into a, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen scenario and are all of those pilots doing it the same way? Uh, like say they're all successful. Can we just say, boom, we did it. Let's implement these everywhere. Or now do we have to pick one, right? I mean, even in Tefka, we're using a specific standard for the assertion of the consent, but in order to meet the industry where it's at, we specify that that consent document can be a fire uh, consent resource or it can be a Kantara consent receipt, or it can be a Zactimal document, or it can just be a scanned PDF, right? <laughs> so good luck to the responding organization, the record holding organization to say, well, you asserted consent, but you picked one of the four that I have no idea what it means. I don't know Zactimal, right? I mean, or, you know, fire, I haven't done fire resources yet or, or whatever. Um, and so like finding like, what is the one, or maybe there's a couple depending on the scenario, but, but the more that we continue to have, everybody comes up with this great solution and says, here's the thing that's gonna solve it. We're gonna go pilot it over here. And someone else says, well, here's the thing that's gonna go solve it. We're gonna go pilot it over here. Great, there's a lot of pilots going on, but they don't actually work together. Um, and so at some point we have to then bring that back together and figure out from the lessons that we learned across these pilots, what's the way that we can actually scale it nationwide because we're not gonna scale it 12 different ways all at once. I think, I think that's a great segue to sort of where we want to end up today's conversation, which is really this idea around sort of how do we get beyond pilots? How do we prove things out? And what is it that the industry needs to really have that happen? And if I think about the thread through all of your comments today and what we heard earlier today, is this idea that the idea of piloting and, and experimenting and see what's working and getting to normalize content and terminology and patterns seems valuable, right? We all seem to, you know, head shake and agree that that's a good idea. And we all agree it's complicated. Um, I, I've got a little bit of a reaction and I, it's funny because looking at the, sort of the folks that are on the panel today, um, including myself, you know, we're all benefiting from people doing things in industry, right? That in previous lives have been considered competitive and we all have agreed they're table stakes, right? That we need to be able to solve to be able to move the industry forward. I guess when I think about this and I think about what's missing and how we're gonna make the next step forward. You know, what are, and, and let's think about this in terms really of, you know, what are the concrete steps that you could see happen in your day-to-day -day world that you're doing that's gonna get us beyond that. Um, I appreciate it, Ryan, sort of delivering the problem sort of on ONC or HHS's doorstep, but, you know, we've seen both ONC and the folks at HHS are following where industry is headed. What are the concrete steps that we could make forward progress on in that next nine to 12 month period, 18 month period, so that there's patterns that, you know, ONC and CMS can actually pick up and enforce or align people around. And I'll go to, I'll go to Ryan first because he opened his mouth up first. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not surprising to you, Jocelyn. Um, <laughs> What I, what I would say is, 
um, there are pilots that are happening. But I would say, though, to, to Alan's point, it, and then there has, Genevieve mentioned this in the chat too, there have been pilots that are occurring. I, I guess the, the question becomes, one, you know, are folks aware of them? You know, let's let's make them more public and have they been written up and can we make sure we get some, get some shining light on it? But two is, are they at the scale and complexity of what we are thinking about, right? Health and human services, CBOs, right? TEFCA, network of networks, right? Patient-centric, uh, B2B, B2C, right? Federal government, private sector. I don't think we've ever done something like that. If we have, we should find out in the chat. If we haven't, could we potentially do that? And I do want to mention a comment on Alan's point, just a friendly amendment to his point. I actually don't think we have to actually choose a single solution for consent. And I, I don't know if healthcare never has enjoyed choosing a single solution for anything, but we could develop a framework for what as actually works best based on the individual region of the country that you're in or the trading partners that you have established. So for example, mm -hmm. you know, Tim Pawlenty did some great job. They standardized the authorization form in the state of Michigan and it's voluntary, but they did it, right? There's no reason why state of Michigan, Indiana, California, you know, maybe California, but other places around the country couldn't say, we're gonna, we're gonna standardize the way we're gonna do consent here locally in the way that we exchange data across health and human services and across healthcare and related to what's going on. So. I, Ryan, that, I gotta just, I gotta ask you though, that's I think just healthcare focused or medicine focused. No, 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 it, it would be both. It would be both. No, so, no, I, I just- You mean social services? Oh, in Michigan, in Michigan. In Michigan. In Michigan. Yeah, yeah. 100%, yes. I, I guess what I was using as an example, Daniel, to say that's one area where at least an entire state has come together to say, we've agreed on this only for healthcare. It's not necessarily health and human services. That's why I was making your point, Daniel, which is we've got to think more holistically public, private, health, healthcare, social needs. So let me, let, let me jump in there. I think that, you know, Mary Sarah and others are saying, hey, there's a lot of pilots out there already. I mean, going back to the sim world, you know, there's a lot of, I think we rush forward so much and don't necessarily sort of mine the knowledge that's out there. The one that I, I, I'm just going to say it out loud, you know, the, the, we are all spending $130 million to support the integrated care for kids sites. And I think there's a, I'll add it myself. I think that there's some opportunity for mining the knowledge because you've got those sites have set up that they have all of the right people at the table across healthcare and child welfare and behavioral health, and education. They spent years preparing those partnership councils so that when they actually got awarded it, they were ready to go, right? And And, that unfortunately, for all sorts of reasons that I'm not privy to, is is being is is not allowing us to really use and study those, especially around consent, because they all need consent. Also, the moms programs all need consent, and yet we're rushing ahead and, and forcing each of them to create their own solution. It's right in front of us. It's literally right in front of us. There's another three or four years left on those cooperative agreements. If we just paid a little more attention to those, they're operating already. And we know how hard it is to get real pilots off the ground. This has been five years until it's there. It, it's just, it's, it, we don't need to start new things. We need to look at what's already happening and surround them in sort of tender loving care and the right amount of resources, the right amount of resources to be able to do this work. And there's so much to learn from it. There's just so much to learn from what's already out there in front of us. I'm gonna give Alan, Jim, um, if you guys can do a quick turn on this one and then we're gonna to go to your wish list, so. Alan, go ahead and I'll wrap it up. Yeah, sure, thanks, Jim. Yeah, Jim dropped video for a little bit, so I bumped up in the spot, I'm ahead of you now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you always so, were, sir, you always were. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure about that. Uh, well, I, I guess I would just say, I mean, uh, again, on, on the point of, of you know, standardizing or having, you know, one, one way of doing it. I think that there, there doesn't necessarily need to be a single way that things are done across all use cases. Um, but when we're, when we're trying to settle on a specific, uh, you know, type of requesting organization, a specific type of thing that they're trying to get, there really does need to be a consistent way that things are done. Um, I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, a lot conceptually here, but then at the end of the day, we're turning around and telling a bunch of EHR vendors, 
that you've got to develop some solution, right? And if the solution is, well, for your customers in Michigan, do this, and your customers in California, do this, and your customers, and, and I mean, they already have to do that, and it's pain, uh, just because of varying state laws. And and I think you know where where again, there's a lot of optionality here uh, outside of where we're not talking about some of the stuff with you know treatment exchange and things that are required. I uh, they they do handle a lot of that that variance for things that are required because they have to. Yeah. Uh, and so putting that amount of variance on something that already isn't required in the first place. Uh, makes it that much more more difficult to get any sort of adoption at scale. Fair point, Al. That's a fair point. Yeah, and uh, agree with Alan and Daniel and Ryan, and just say again, I think it also brings up to how we find both those those carrot and stick incentivization points, and and also agree with, uh, uh, and I think we're already starting to find out as we discover more and look at these various pilots and look at what um a, a cornucopia of capabilities would be that there's not going to be a perfect answer and you'll have a multitude of of potentially of choices to choose from in terms of how it's implemented to fit specific use cases uh, but it's daniel who's brought up before that you know in many cases care especially social care is hyper local so we address at the hyper local level first and then build scalability from there uh, including whatever is necessary from the technical approach I'm going to hand it back to you, Stefan, or Trish Lee. I don't know who's picking up from here, but from um, our standpoint today, I really appreciate everybody's input, and I think we've surfaced a lot of good points um, and uh, hopefully haven't uh, sent the message that we're handing it all back to you guys to figure out, but that we think that ONC has an integral part, as well as your colleagues over at CMS and HHS in general. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Jocelyn, and the rest of our panelists. Um, I hope that didn't seem like too much of an abrupt end to the uh, panel there. Um, honestly, I, I was texting uh, Trisha Lee in the background here saying how much I was loving this panel, and I really thought it put a, a great bow on the end of the day here. Um, I, it was almost as if it was by design. I joked with her because it was by design. We intentionally wanted to land at this place. And uh, if you think about the arc we took over this afternoon, right, we did cover a lot of ground. Right. We did start with that regulatory overview. I think that in itself could have been a full afternoon and, and really credit Catherine for um, for being able to kind of compact that into a short presentation. And I'm sure many of you are eager to get your hands on, on those slides. Um, and then, you know, for Pooja and the job that she did taking us through, um, you know, all the, the current efforts that are out there, a sampling of them anyhow, as best she could. I think that was another great sense. Um, and then the, the breakups that we had, um, you know, both earlier before the break as well as after the break. Um, you know, I think that people were highly engaged throughout the day. The chat probably is 100, maybe 200 pages long. If we print that out, it's going to take us quite a while to synthesize and go through that and come out with some of the key findings. And that is our goal, really. We said this several times, but we know people were jumping in and out. So just to reiterate, we will be posting the recordings for the breakouts. We're going to do our best to post the recordings and or the slides from those, although we know we did have some technical difficulties in a few of them. Um, with the, the independent recording. So we're going to see uh, if we can get a, get a hold of all those and post them. Uh, we'll also be seeing what we can post from the chats. I don't know if we'll post a full uh, breakdown of the chats or if we'll just pull out some of the key, you know, uh, resources that were listed and things like that. So summaries of it. Um, but we'll, we'll do our best to post that uh, and kind of summarize as much as we can. Some of the things that I heard throughout the day, and I'll turn it over to Trisha Lee after this to kind of wrap it up. Um, one was I liked this healthy debate just around something as simple as decentralized versus distributed versus federated and the definitions between those two. So maybe that's a future topic that we can dive into and clarify a little bit more um, for, for the full audience, because we know some of you may have your own interpretation of that and understand that, but it seems like there's still some debate amongst uh, this community about that. And if we're trying to move to some kind of model like that, it would it'd be good to have us all on the same page about it. Um, that trusted consent uh, it, you know, mechanisms uh, are, are gonna be critical going forward and, and you know, having that trust framework to support that um, is, is something that's really gonna be valuable. Um, Need to get, needing to get beyond small local pilots and moving towards, uh, you know, testing this stuff at scale, you know, including looking at network to network um, uh, use of e-consent. Um, segmentation, this is something that I heard throughout the day many times, and this isn't a surprise, but we still haven't landed on a, a great technical approach for this that, that's repeatable and, and consistent. But uh, the ability to segment data and then have that tracked with your, your e-consent um, is, is gonna be key uh, for all these different use cases. Uh, and then also importantly, keeping the patient's user experience in mind throughout all of this, um, empowering them to be uh, uh, informed and in control of, of uh, mediating their data exchange uh, and, and accessing it. Um, and then the last two things I wanted to mention is this broader conversation of, of the fact that we need, this is just a great jumping off point, but um, you know, there's a lot of you know, uh, gratitude, it sounds like from our uh, audience and from our, our speakers today 
that ONC was providing this forum, but um, but also that that we do want to kind of use this as a jumping off point to further kind of the conversation in, in more kind of specific targeted ways. Um, so you're figuring out how we can continue and expand our efforts to also coordinate across our other federal partners, as some of you may have read and was referenced by Ryan, I think, um, that you know uh, the Secretary of HHS has asked us and, and, and sent out notification to the other agencies for us to play an even larger role in ensuring that there's some consistent approaches for health IT and interoperability and standards uh, across all the efforts, procurement efforts, et cetera, uh, throughout HHS. Um, and you know we'll continue to also leverage the Federal Health IT Coordinating Council, which represents 40 federal agencies, not just HHS, uh, whenever we can. Um, and then also, um, again, just making sure we figure out how do we kind of keep all this information readily accessible and discoverable for, for a, you know, not only today's audience, but also a broader uh, community that, that might be interested in this. So maybe that includes uh, establishing a, a resource page on ONC's website on healthit.gov uh, to kind of capture and make it easy to, to kind of navigate and find this. Even in just the preparation of this event, we, um, we had to kind of go back and look at a bunch of the, you know, the times that ONC has dabbled in e-consent in one way or another. We were, you know, surveying different people across ONC to pull it together because it wasn't easy to find all in one place. Um, and in the meantime, maybe Project Unified's uh, white paper is a good place for people to start because it does capture so much of that that information. So with that, I'll turn it to Trista Lee to, to um, uh, see if she's had any other uh, quick thoughts. Um, this was a wonderful, wonderful workshop. I think that this was new territory for us. We call it a discovery workshop because unlike some of the typical uh, conferences that we have where we are kind of, you know, marching to a certain beat and we want, you know, a certain conclusion to plant the flag, we recognize that there's so much going on here that we really do have to pause and stop and listen. And I think we did that. Um, and I am just so impressed in how folks came ready to participate. And so I, I'm impressed with the level of engagement that we had. And certainly staff, we have a lot of a lot of chat logs to read through and certainly to go back through this recording. And I'm with Stefan that we need to find a way to um, immortalize this, uh, this the record of this conversation and, and share this uh, the, the input that we have with all of you. Um, a number of things that kind of resonated with me thinking about the day. Well, first, let me just say that, you know, this, this uh, wrap up session, we, we intended to include um, some representatives from uh, local government. However, due to some conflicts, you know, it's a critical time right now, the local space, uh, they weren't able to join us. Um, um, but certainly, I think that this is something that is really going to be an all hands on deck. This is not going to be kind of the government solves it all. Uh, take it and run with it, but really, you know, thinking about how it really works. And there are great examples that are taking place, I think, in uh, regions. Um, but going back to the kind of the start of the day, I, I was, um, what kind of uh, resonated with me was this, the, the thoughts and the threads in the chat that, you know, when we started talking about the legal regulatory framework, that uh, legal concerns uh, are not necessarily aligning with patient and individual concerns. And that if we're thinking about building solutions that, you know, keep us you know, out of trouble, uh, that that's not going to meet the need. It'll, it'll continuously fall short of what people actually find value in as far as what makes what's meaningful for them and how they uh, their data is shared. Um, and then to some of the points I made in the last panel and to things that um, make sense from, from a good business, strong business uh, perspective. And so I think that we have to learn to work within um, the laws that are there because, you know, we're not going to change those here on this workshop or any other workshop. But how do we kind of shift our thinking in as far as not operating from what keeps us out of trouble, but um, what actually works for people? Um, that uh, resonated with me. I also echo uh, with you that, you know, we need to work on the trust and the, uh, the, uh, the digital identification and certainly in some of the breakouts, uh, being able to um, segment data. We heard that um, again and again. Um, I definitely want to echo the points that were made about using some of our resources through the ISA um, and other commenting pathways that we have to make sure that we hear um, that from you. Um, and then kind of going back to that county space, um, you know, for me personally, again, this is Trish Lee Rolls <laughs> take on things. I really do think um, it's uh, all of the above and, and I, I um, do think that when we think about trust, it's easier for individual individuals to trust what's happening in their local community, or at least with local organizations, and then now making a jump to what might be happening nationally is a, is a whole other uh, situation. Um, but I, you know, think um, and reflecting on this is kind of like, not just what we can do, Stefan at ONC, but like, what are we going to do to help support um, some of the things that are happening at different states or in different counties? 
um, where they have these very compelling use cases um, and individuals that are accessing services repeatedly and multiple times and so and in multiple ways and thinking about you know you know we looked at this and thought about this with starting point of healthcare because that's what we do at ONC but certainly we uh, need to evolve our own thinking and expand our own um, federal partner network to think about this uh, beyond just healthcare. Um, as was mentioned, we said in HIPAA and outside of HIPAA, um, just because people are going to enter consent pathways from different entry points. It's not just I'm in my provider's office. We talked a lot about that today, but it might be that people have different um, compelling social service needs or educational needs and, and that then require access or exchange of information. So I think we have some work to do internally about that. But the conversation will not end here today. Um, this is certainly a starting point for us, and we're so happy that you could uh, come with us on this journey. I want to thank all of our um, moderators, our staff volunteers who helped us today. I want to thank all of our SMEs and experts who volunteered their time and expertise to help work us through <laughs> uh, the tough parts and tough conversations in our agenda. I certainly want to thank all of those who helped conceptualize this workshop. Um, as Stefan mentioned, this was a thought a year ago. Um, a lot happened, and then we came back several months ago put our heads together with a number of individuals and organizations um, that were on this call to really think about where, where are we and what do we need. Um, and I certainly want to thank all of our attendees who showed up on a, on a Tuesday um, and, and helped us um, you know, work through this. And so I know that we're getting close to time, but we are going to make this recording available to you. And we encourage you to share this with your colleagues who could not be here, to share this with others as well. And we look forward to circling back and being able to share what our next steps are from this, whether it is through uh, the recording, um, through printed summary materials, and certainly through any future meetings and convenings that we have to really help move this forward. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. We have a lot, we heard a lot, and we have a lot to digest following this, but I do want to wish everyone a a wonderful rest of your day. Um, and again, thank you so much for contributing to this discovery workshop. Could not have done this without you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.